Hello everyone. Welcome to the Nelson Mandela Foundation. Sorry for the delayed start. Uh, and thank you all for coming out tonight. I think we have the first bites of winter. So I know it's difficult. Um, my name is Khalil Goga. I work here at the Nelson Mandela Foundation in the Dialogue Program. And um, today we're going to be talking about something particularly important for the Nelson Mandela Foundation. What does racism look like in the future? Um, what are we developing now that will impact us in the next 20 years, 30 years, um, 50 years? In Yuval Noah, Noah Hariri's Sapiens, he states, History began when humans invented gods and will end when humans become gods. This and his subsequent work speak to the rise of artificial intelligence and the development of biological adaptations that will alter humans, possibly leading to a type of immortality. We now stand at the precipice of changes that will fundamentally alter the world and the outcomes are beyond our comprehension. This has a profound impact on how we understand race, a subject that we are still grappling with. So beyond the hatred on social media, we need to think, what does this technological change mean at an existential level? For us, as a memory institution, we have to understand how the past and the present continually shape the future. There is no blank slate going forward. In building and visioning a future, we must be deliberate and methodical. What we build, we build with our own biases. And what we see when we imagine the future is from our own experiences. Therefore, when those that develop these technologies are overwhelmingly white and male, there are compounding difficulties. We have to account for this. And we have already seen some of the effects as supposedly neutral machines develop biases. In the United States, algorithms used to determine the likelihood of reoffending so-called risk assessments have been proven to be biased against black people. A report last year proved that the Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions, COMPASS, mistakenly labeled black defendants as more likely to reoffend at almost twice the rate as white people. At the same time, we must consider that race is not the only factor. Women are still less represented in technology-related fields and in many digital spaces. Women are subjected to some of the most horrendous types of violence directed toward them, and as we have seen, this violence can take new shapes, such as the sharing of private photos. Gender-based violence and exclusion is now digital. Technology is no panacea for the inequalities and problems in the world, but it can provide accelerated ways to finding solutions. But like all change and disruption, it can further entrench inequalities. In 2017, Stanford University ran a survey on the policy preferences of wealthy elites in Silicon Valley. They found that technology entrepreneurs were primarily Democrats with predispositions toward racial tolerance, non authoritarianism non-authoritarianism, and cosmopolitanism. And they supported liberal, redistributive, and social and globalistic policies. However, they generally oppose regulation, and many believe that inequality is a necessary consequence of capitalism, and that small slices of genius are more important than the combined efforts of many. The research found that many believe that the best long-term solution is a guaranteed basic income along with growing automation and robotics. Essentially, this becomes one of fully automated luxury communism. Is this the future we want? Is this the best case? And what happens in the worst case, when states are completely beholden to technology companies? Is this something we should resist? What forms of resistance does this take? Um, and how do we resist these elites that have, are often alienated from people? At the same time, while we may focus on what's happening in the United States, we have to look at other areas. Uh, from the growth of technological company, technology powerhouses in China that work in tandem with the state to companies in Russia. You know, we have to, we have to be aware of all these kinds of things. Um, 
And as we look to the future, we have to build a future that we can imagine and build inclusively. As the Nelson Mandela Foundation, part of our strategy is to support some of the most phenomenal activists here in South Africa and in the United States through the Atlantic Fellowship for Racial Equity, known as AFRI. It is a great delight that I can say that our facilitator, as well as two of our speakers here tonight, are part of the inaugural cohort of uh, AFRI Fellows. Um, we'll also hear from the AFRI Program Director who will sort of outline the project. In saying this, I'd like to thank our funder, the Hunt Seidel Foundation, for supporting this event. They quickly agreed to host this event, noting that they found it a critical topic in their work supporting governance and democracy. I would also like to thank the Harvard Center for African Studies, who we have partnered with, with on this event, and to Obenawa, our facilitator this evening. Uh, finally, I would like to thank our speakers. I know our AFRI speakers had to turn down dinner at the Yeovil Dinner Club tonight to be here with us, which is a shame for them. Um, and also to the, the rest of our speakers, uh, Toby, Professor Mar Marwala, and Professor Mshlanga. Um, just to note, there will be a register that will be passed around. If you guys could just sign that. And uh, I'd like to hand over to Mikaela Pomels, the Program Director of AFRI. Thank you, Khalil, and good evening. Um, I'm going to spend just a few minutes telling you a little bit more about the AFRI program before I hand it over to Abenoa for the evening's program. Atlantic Fellows for Racial Equity is a fellowship that's based in both U.S. and South Africa for individuals working on issues related to social justice and equity. It's one of five fellowships that exist across the globe that came to be um, during the final stages of a global foundation called Atlantic Philanthropies, hence the name Atlantic Fellows. The AFRI program specifically focuses on dismantling anti-black racism and white supremacy in the service of creating a more just and inclusive world. Um, the AFRI goals are to bring together individuals to engage in learning, in sharing, in solidarity building, in working and thinking together. Um, it's also uh, meant to be a space, an idea space, for folks to come together across sector, across issue, across geography, across movement to discuss and come up with strategies to dismantle anti-black racism and white supremacy. Our fellows um, are culture changers, they're artists, they are advocates, lawyers, organizers, activists, um, working across the globe um, with cent on issues related to land, justice, education, and work centering at the dismantlement of anti-black racism. We don't do this work alone. The core team of AFRI sits in New York at Columbia University, but we are partnered with the Nelson Mandela Foundation, who's hosting this event tonight. They also spearhead the South Africa AFRI operations. We have a number of other partners who are also represented here tonight, the Center for Community Change, um, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, um, the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society, who have all participated in the creation of this program. Um, we are also collaborating with partners in South Africa, with PARI, the Public Affairs Research Institute, and the SAHRC. So I thank them for our support. I thank our fellows tonight for being on this panel, and I thank you all for being here tonight to um, support this program. Program. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Obenawa. So thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How is everyone tonight? Good. That's a, that's a good response. And like Khalil said, thank you for being here. It's a little bit nippy outside, although I think some of my American colleagues feel like it's just about summertime, given what they're used to. Um, but we know there are many places that you could have been, and so we're very appreciative of your coming to lend us your time and your thoughts as we consider this topic of racism and technology. And to get us started, I first wanted to just frame the conversation, the reason that we are here tonight. And first and foremost, it's really about being beginning a discussion. The reality is that we are not going to solve this issue in the next hour and a half. But we can begin to think about 
racism, structural inequality, and how it can either be advanced by technology or how we can use technology to create more inclusive societies. We can also begin to get greater insight into some of the issues that we need to be looking at, thinking about, exploring. If we think back over the past year, whether it was uh, election fraud, whether it was Facebook and fake news, as we've seen in the past couple of days, the IAAF and its sort of new ruling around biological testing and whether or not people like Castor Semenya can participate in particular events. Those are some of the things that really I think are at the forefront of our minds, the forefront of our imaginations. But there are many other issues that we need to be considering. And so I guess our hope this evening is that you would leave with more questions than answers. But more than that, you'd leave a little bit inspired to begin to think about in your own life, in your own spaces, how you can use technology to advance equality. And to assist us in this conversation, we have a very distinguished panel that I will introduce shortly. But first, First, just to tell you that we will be in dialogue, the six of us, for about 20 to 30 minutes um, based on each panelist's area of expertise. And then we'll open up the floor and really do want to have a robust conversation where we're better able to engage one another and to understand some of these issues. And so I will start uh, with the Vice Chancellor, who is here on my left. And I have to say congratulations, Vice Chancellor. I think last time I saw you, you were a deputy. And so there's been movements in the past few months. And you'll see, I have four pages worth of biographies, which I'm going to try to skip through. That's just to say that our panel is legit. They actually know what they're talking about. So the Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Marwala, is the VC and principal of the University of Johannesburg. As I said, he was previously the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Internationalization, as well as the Dean of Engineering um, and a Professor of Electrical Engineering. He was also the Carl and Emily Fuchs Chair of Systems and Control Engineering, um, as well, and has held a number of other positions. I think probably what is most impressive is that he has supervised 47 masters and 23 PhD students in his career to completion, and has also published over 300 technical papers and 12 books. He looks quite robustly at artificial intelligence as well as a number of other issues and will be speaking to us along those lines this evening. Please join me in welcoming the Vice Chancellor. Next, we have someone who will by no means be a stranger, Mr. Toby Shapshak, who writes and speaks about how innovation is better in Africa. He has given a TED Talk about how Africa is solving real problems, which has been viewed by over 1.4 million people. I suspect some of them are in this room. He's also been featured in the New York Times. He has hosted a weekly TV show on CNBC Africa for the past three years and, done, and been on many other platforms. But I think the key issue is that he believes that Africa is a mobile driven continent and that through the difficulties that we have faced, we are actually better poised than many other parts of the world to use technology to overcome these difficulties. A bit of a note in terms of trivia, he is no stranger to the Nelson Mandela Foundation. He ran the Mailing Guardian as a journalist, uh, its website, when it was the first news site in Africa. And as part of that, he shadowed Nelson Mandela when he was president and covered the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Please join me in welcoming Toby. We then have one of my fellow fellows in the Atlantic Fellowship for Racial Equity, uh, Tenmori Sanjurahajan, who is a delete American transmedia storyteller, a technologist, and a journalist who believes story is the most important unit of social change. She is the founder of Equality Labs, which is one of the first South Asian startups that uses community research, socially engaged art, and technology to end the oppression of caste apartheid, Islamophobia, white supremacy, and religious intolerance. Equality Labs centers the leadership of South Asian religious, cultural, and genderqueer minorities. She is the co-founder of Dalit History Month and a number of other uh, projects, uh, both in the US as well as in South Africa. Her art, technology, and writing has been recognized by the Producers Guild of the American Diversity Program, the Museum of Contemporary Art, as well as a number of other global institutions. And as previously stated, not only is she an inaugural fellow of the Atlantic Fellowship for Racial Equity, she was also part of the inaugural cohort of the Robert Rauschenberg Socially Engaged Artist as Activist Fellowship. Please join me in welcoming Tenmore. 
And then we have, next to Tim Mori, another Atlantic fellow, Rashida Phillips, who is the managing attorney of the Landlord-Tenant Housing Unit at Community Legal Services of Philadelphia. She began her career at CLS in 2008 as a Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network Martin Luther King Jr. Fellow in the Community Economic Development Unit. And in that capacity, she provided legal assistance, representation, and resources to low-income childcare businesses and nonprofit community organizations. In addition to her work at CLS, Rashida has been working in the community for over a decade with organizations such as Communities and Schools and Project Peace to mentor young parents by speaking on her experiences as a young mother and demonstrating that success is still possible despite all of life's difficulties. She is also a member of a number of, of the board of a number of different nonprofit initiatives, but most notably, Rashida is the founder of the Afrofuturist Affair Black Quantum Futurism Collective. Uh, and as well as a founding member of Metro Polarity Queer Sci-Fi Collective and a self-published speculative fiction author of multiple books. So I think we'll have quite a bit to talk about and she might even just show us the way to Wakanda, but we'll see. Um, Musa Mplanga is an honorary professor, research professor, in the Division of Chemical Systems and Synthetic Biology in the Department of Integrated Biomedical Services at the University of Cape Town. An American-born cell biologist, he holds, holds a PhD in cell biology and molecular genetics from NYU School of Medicine, and he began his PhD at the Rockefeller University in the laboratory of David Ho, where he worked on spectral genotyping of human alleles. I'm not going to lie. When I looked at this bio, I needed to hit the dictionary. There are, there are a couple terms in he then went on to work on the development of in vitro and in vivo applications of molecular beacons for their use in visualizing RNA in living cells with Fred Russell Kramer and Sanjay Taggi at New York University. Upon completing his doctoral work, he was awarded a US National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellowship at the Institut Pasteur in Paris, uh, where he worked in the laboratory of nuclear cell biology. Please join me in welcoming Musa. And I think to get us started, perhaps I'll begin with you, Musa. We were talking a little bit earlier uh, just about this idea of race and biology. And I think for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to define racism very broadly as that system of beliefs, practices, institutions that exclude people of color based on their race. Broad definition, imperfect, but for the purposes of this conversation. So Musa, perhaps you could talk a little bit about your view of race as a scientist and how you think it influences the sciences or how the, inf the sciences have influenced our constructions and understanding of race. First of all, thank you so much to uh, every, the organizers to, for inviting me. Um, it's really an honor to be here. I, um, I guess this is a, is a very complex two-part question, and I, I'll try to be as uh, precise as possible and as brief as possible. Um, so I think the first part of your question is how do should science, and I say should because I think Historically, science hasn't always looked at this in the, in the way I'm going to describe, is that I think now we, in science, we, we should and, and generally are treating race as, as a non-scientific or biological description. So there, is no, there are no races as we would define them scientifically. They, they are things called um, ancestry groups and they are populations of people. And I think this is a very important uh, and very precise definition that we should all keep in the forefront of our minds. And, and the reason it's so important is because um, it speaks to the fact that um, this idea of race really arose most powerfully in the 19th century with a lot of um, sort of uh, European thinkers who, who really defined humanity as, as four races, just four. And they, I think they had these horrible names like Mongols and Negroids and, you know, and, and I guess Caucasians was kind of the nicer word they used to describe themselves. But it, 
it sort of defined the sense that these were really pure groups of humanity. But actually, um, the, the science is, is actually very, very different. And the science shows that everybody, without exception, on almost every continent, including Africa, is highly, highly mixed. And, and in fact, the differences between uh, people in their superficial definitions of how their skin color looks like have, have always been highly mutable, have been changing over thousands of years, and, and, and are really um, 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 just almost, we call phenotypic. They're just at the surface. Um, they are definitely variations between different populations and people of different ancestry. And these variations are genetic. And these are really small, average variations between groups. And, and, and I think technology from genomics and, and our understanding of, say, ancient DNA that can give us a historical record of this, this combination of these two things are really informing us that we actually um, share a lot of things but we actually have differences that have arisen over time in certain population groups. And some of them are beneficial because we've adapted to certain regions of the world, uh, whether it's altitude, whether it's sickle cell anemia, and some of them are less beneficial or, let's we say, not so well adapted to modern life in certain places. So I think we have to preserve precision in the way we uh, talk about this. So the second part of your question is really, for me, um, how, let's call it, uh, we could improve the participation of people who are non-white in the study of um, our biology, our shared biology. I think this is a serious problem. And I think that um, if we look at um, the number of genomes that have been sequenced and who they belong to, um, it's, it's where we see in these numbers that there's really a, 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 a really flagrant omission uh, of a large swath of humanity. And so um, just to put precision again on those numbers, there, there have been over 100,000 human genomes that have been sequenced. Um, over 90% of these have only come from people of European descent. Um, and um, about 5% of these have come from people of Asian descent. Now, remember I said that people are extremely mixed, right? And, but we know that they have, there are differences that have arisen over time because people have been geographically separated over millennia. Um, and the real tragedy of this omission of people from Asia and Africa is that African genomes, which are the oldest in the world, only represent about 2% of genomes that have been sequenced, and yet have the, the richest diversity of, of human information, if you like. So, um, so I guess this, is this answers your second part, which is something that should be addressed because it has great significance um, for us understanding each other, but also for, for our own health and, and our own um, well-being. And I think, I hope that this conversation that we have uh, will, will help us to illuminate some of these issues more deeply. Thank you for that. Rashida, perhaps you could speak a little bit from your perspective as someone who deals uh, with housing, who deals with issues of equality. Musa has spoken uh, quite a bit on just this issue of biology and the fact that there is no real, there's no such thing biologically as racism. But because of geographic, lo or is race, but because of geographic locations, there are perhaps differences that should be studied. Your work looks at people who live in particular communities in the world. Perhaps you could speak a little bit from a legal perspective, and particularly around housing, as to how uh, technology has been used to either advance inclusive communities or has been used to exclude people. This. Hello? Okay. Um, yeah, so, yeah, my work is primarily in housing, and um, just to put a little bit of context on that, um, I represent people who are facing eviction, um, facing homelessness, facing displacement, facing gentrification. Um, I represent people directly in those situations, but also do a lot of policy work around those various issues. Um, I think there's many, many ways in which um, technology comes to bear upon um, 
people, particularly low income people, when it comes to securing housing, when it comes to maintaining their housing. Um, one of the ways in which this, this plays out, um, and I'm speaking from the context of Philadelphia, which is primarily where my housing work is based, and the fact that um, we see 24,000 evictions a year, eviction filings. So these are just complaints filed against people to have them removed from their homes. 24,000, um, and we're in Philadelphia, the largest, poorest major city in the country. Um, most of that 24,000 people facing eviction are people, sorry, keep getting a signal, okay. Um, are people of, are, are black women. Uh, I'm not even gonna say people of color, it's very specific, it's black women who are facing eviction and who are being put out of their homes. They say, black men get locked up, black women get locked out. So that is precisely the situation that we're dealing with. And it plays out in the clients that we see, which is that 83% of my clients um, are black women. So it, it is a very specific type of racism that we see going on here when it comes to housing um, and who gets housed. Um, so some of the ways that technology impacts upon this um, is that, so when you file an eviction against someone, um, it's a public record, and it's a public record forever. So just criminal records, for example, we have laws in, in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia where your criminal record can be expunged under, circum circ under certain circumstances. It can be wiped out. Your eviction record cannot be expunged. And this is just a filing. So it's not even, it may not have even reached a conclusion where you were put out of your property. It may, it may have been a situation where you were perfectly in the right and the landlord is just filing something to harass you. Regardless of that, that is a public record. It's open. Anybody can type, go on a website, type your name in and find out, um, you know, that something was filed against you and, and whatever accusations the person is making. And this is used again and again and again to deny people future housing. Um, so, um, for example, um, one of the things that any landlord will do, um, aside, so there's not, it's not a credit check, it's a tenant screening report. And so with that tenant screening report comes this score and they look at whether you have criminal records, how many eviction filings you've had. Um, it doesn't even tell you the conclusion, again, of that filing. Um, it looks at all of these other things and like aggregates a score and says this person is worthy of being housed or this person isn't worthy of being housed. So this is one of the ways that, that it plays out. Um, and then in addition, again, the criminal record um, also plays out in this way in that th these criminal records are very often public record unless you're under a certain age or you're a juvenile. Um, and even then, sometimes people can get access to those records. And those records are used to make all kinds of decisions about people, about housing, about their livelihood, about their um, ability to become employed. And this is well after they've done whatever they've done, they've served whatever time they've served, even if it was just an arrest, this stuff pops up for people. So I routinely have clients in my office who are seniors, 65 years old or, or older, may have done something 40, 50 years ago, that record is keeping them out of housing. It's keeping them out of affordable housing, it's keeping them out of senior housing, and they're on the streets, they're in shelters. Um, I literally had this woman, paraplegic, didn't have legs or arms, in a wheelchair. She got a arrest record from the 1964 um, from being present during a riot um, in, in um, a part of Philadelphia that was undergoing um, a lot of uh, issues related to policing and things like that. And these issues continue today. Um, there's this thread of, of, of history that, that pulls into the present. Um, and for her in particular, that record came up. This woman is in a wheelchair, cannot, has been denied housing left and right, and is still in a homeless shelter, and this was over a year ago. So these are, these are just some of the issues. I could talk all day about them, um, but these are some of the things that come up for folks in housing and, and the ways in which big data and records impact people's ability to live, um, not only in the present, but far into the future, and it impacts upon um, their ability to get benefits, um, to, to do all sorts of things. And, and just kind of going back to this question around racism and technology, I kind of see it as a technology is racism, and I see race as a technology. So it's, for me, it's not a question of and, it, it's, it's a is question. It's, it's you know, just switching that article. Um, because particularly in America, um, when you kind of trace the, the history of slavery and, 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 and black enslavement in America, our bodies were literally technology. Um, and then just 
the whole field in, of, of science and, and, and the medical field was based on experimentation on our black bodies. Um, so when you talk about technology, racism is, in, is, is embedded in the meaning, uh, or at least the modern day meaning of, of what technology is. And, and just hearing from, from you um, confirming these ideas around um, there is no biological reality of race. So race as a social construct itself is a technology and it's, and it's used in that way. It's used as a device um, you know, for, for, for many different things. So. Thank you. I think that's very helpful. And just to highlight a, a thread between your comments, Rashida, and Musa's, what strikes me, and again, when we talk about racism, we're not just talking about the interactions between people. I think sometimes when we think about technology and racism, the infamous penny sparrows of the world come to mind. But from both of your comments, it seems like it's very much structural. So Musa, you're speaking about the fact that Africa has the most genetic variation, yet only 2% of the genomes that have been mapped are African genomes. So again, structure. That means means that diseases that tend to affect particular um, African groups of people might not get the same recognition as the 90% of Caucasian people who have had their genome mapped. So again, very structural. What you're speaking about, Rashida, again, very structural in terms of housing as a basic human right. But the fact that structurally, simply because someone cannot be forgotten, something that a complaint that was simply made, structurally it creates barriers for them that never would have existed before. I think your, your sentiment that racism is technology is also very provocative, and I've never thought about it in that way. But this idea that it's similar to a social security number, similar to um, a digital footprint, that your body can be used as a way to categorize you, I think is something that perhaps Tenmori could pick up on as well, and this notion of bodies themselves as being technology. Now, Musa has spoken very much from an, an African or global perspective. Uh, Rashida has taken us to a very specific community in the US. Tenmori, I think to take it more um, to people of color outside of these locations, perhaps you could reflect a bit on your work in India, and also just talk about from a global structural perspective, what is it that we're seeing happening structurally that we need to be paying attention to? So I think for me, my entry point in terms of the conversation around surveillance and digital security really, really came from my own experience of being digitally harassed online. I was one of the first Dalits, and, and Dalit is a term that we use to speak about being the community that was formerly known as the untouchable community. Um, when we spoke out, and I was one of the first um, Dalit women who was active on multiple um, web platforms, um, I, I received you know thousands of death threats and thousands of rape threats. And at the time when that happened, there was very few people who actually knew how to support me. And also, when those online threats um, uh, became offline threats, there were still very few people who knew how to support and understand the problem of this harassment, not just from a technical lens, but from a structural lens, so that we could look at the conversation of what is happening on these social media platforms, which feel like public spaces, but are in fact corporate surveilled closed houses where we are basically divulging so much of our intimate lives and movement conversations to people who are harvesting and making money off of them. And when that happened for me, I started to look for solutions. And uh, I looked for solutions, particularly because the Dalit community is 300 million people large. Um, and we're part of one of the largest markets in Facebook. Currently, we're the number one country on Facebook right now, India. Um, and I think what was fascinating to me was that no one could talk about this as a political problem. Everybody saw this as a technical problem. So Facebook is like, oh, we're going to fix this with AI. We're going to fix this with, you know, our, our, our AI is going to be able to understand epithets. And the thing that's interesting, particularly for countries that have multiple languages that aren't English languages, um, is that Facebook's algorithm does not know how to deal with any of our problems. So I'll take, for example, the issue of atrocity. So in India, you know, it's very common, like every hour, three Dalits are murdered, two are raped, and three houses are burnt. And when there's an atrocity, we mobilize on Facebook. We use the hashtag of the, of the location. And the English hashtag is usually used by Dalit activists. But the, the, the hashtag of the same location in the local dialect will often be used by the perpetrators. And when they use that, um, they'll talk about, the, they'll, they'll glorify the murder. So in one, in one instance, I remember them 
talking about this is what happens when you come to our women. If you come more, we have more knives for you. Let the blood rain. Let the blood rain. And Facebook would not track the hate. Because the, most of the people that were training their algorithms, the people that were community managing, were actually all English speakers working in AC offices that were also all you know, upper caste. And I think this also really also speaks to the fact that when we're looking at social media platforms and the idea of Silicon Valley technology, it is really a techno-capitalist project. And I think we have to look at the way that we're seeing technology from the global north being used to oppress communities within the global south in the name of development. And, and when we talk about using IT in the name of development, we have to really look at what are we giving up in order to get that handout of quote unquote innovation when we actually, we're exporting our own IT talent to oppress ourselves. So that to me is really profound, particularly because when you look at all the Silicon Valley organizations, the primary tech talent actually comes from India and, and from the global south. And so um, some of the challenges that I see as we start to really start to take this conversation in terms of the structural is that the techno-capitalism of many of these platforms is really the big conversation that we need to have. Because as someone who does digital security, digital security is really a reactionary response to a moment that requires actually a visionary call to action. Because with digital security, what you're doing is you're already assuming that harm is going to be there. We're going to expect women women and gender queer minorities and people of color to always have our privacy rights um, affected, to always have our right of expression to be curtailed, and that our data is not our own. And this is the fundamental thing that we have to look at, is that the information economy at this moment is shifting. We are in a new industrial revolution. And in this industrial revolution, we're seeing a convergence of technologies that include 3D printing, that include AI, that include biometrics. And as these converge, what we're seeing is it is also an extractive economy. But this time, the resource that we're drilling is ourselves. And that's really what's at stake when we start to talk about data and the data mining of these platforms is what do we lose when our very existential presence is what we're selling, both as countries, both as communities, and both as individuals. And that the fact that so many people are doing it without our countries protecting us, without us having proper affirmative consent, and without us being able to do it within technological structures that are just and have a different way forward than what is coming out of the global north. And so for me, I think I want to be able to have conversations that not just look at current technologies being racist, but also look at what would it mean if we were to create visionary technology together that would center women and gender queer minorities. Imagine a social media platform that was only only run and community managed by women and gender queer minorities from the global south. What would that look like? What would the values be? What would be the kinds of conversations we would have as a globe? Because keep in mind when we talk about Facebook, Facebook was developed by white dudes go, who were at Harvard who wanted to find a way to be able to pick up hot chicks. Is that the skill set that is required to be able to manage global conversation and harness democracy? So with that, I think I'm going to just pop it over to the white dude. <laughs> Toby, did you go to Harvard? Shit, no, I did not <laughs> go to Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> I, you took my point out of my mouth. The, the bottom line about Facebook is written by um, someone who was trying to get laid at Harvard. Um, and that's the framing of it. You know, the, what was the question? So, <laughs> I didn't actually ask one. I was just going to let you roll with it. But um, I, I think really the question is, so uh, Facebook comes up over and over and over again. It is ubiquitous. Um, and I think Tenmori has raised a number of critical points that we will come back to. But in February last year, Mark Zuckerberg wrote what was a 6,000 word piece on Facebook. And he talked about changing the world. And it was premised on this idea of building a global community. And I think for some of us, if you read it on its own, it's inspiring. But if you actually look at Facebook, nothing has really happened. So from your perspective, what is it that Zuckerberg or Facebook, and perhaps those of us who so willingly divulge so much of our lives, what is it that we don't get? That's a good question. The, so the fundamental problem that we all make about Facebook is that we think Facebook is 
operating in our best interest. It isn't. We are not the users of Facebook. We are the product. The users of Facebook are the advertisers. And the phrase that's, that's emerged in the last few months, in the last year, is uh, surveillance capitalism. We live in a surveillance economy. It's way, way worse than Stratcom or, or anything the apartheid government did because we do it for free. We give away all of this information about ourselves so that advertisers can show us better adverts. Not so it can make the world a better place. It's so that people who want to target us can target us better. And, it, and, and that's the most benign version of what Facebook's about. The problem with social media is that is, is what it does is make the fractures in society worse and more pronounced because people have a bigger loud hailer. And the stuff that you see is just mind-bogglingly bad. The, the misogyny, the race hate, the, the anti-Semitism, the, the threats of rape, the threats of murder. I mean, I, I can't believe that people do that. Like, what right-thinking person in the world will say something like that on a on a public platform? And there's some kind of 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 level of um, of of there's a kind of a, a lowering of people's. Um, I'm looking for the word. Uh, not sensitivity, but also what's permissible. People will say and do things on social media that you would never say to someone's face. It, it, it's, it's just, it just lowers the tolerance of what people would, be, would, would do in public to another person. And it, and it desensitizes people significantly. Um, I mean, we look at the, the, the two major massive events that have happened that are a direct result of, of Facebook's lack of uh, of understanding how their platform can be undermined. Remember, so, so in a pure technology perspective, as Silicon Valley says, look at this wonderful new platform that lets us connect people. I think that's the current phrase, connecting people, a better world. Well, they never seem to think that anyone would subvert it for the kinds of things they do. The, 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 the white supremacists who use these hashtags uh, or, or multiple brackets to donate if you're Jewish. Um, denote, not den donate, um, and, and there's, no, there's no way people pick on it. Why? Because the people moderating it live in an ivory tower, and they just don't see the bad in society. If you look at Trump, uh, Trump's election and what happened with Brexit, you know, what, what we can see is that America won the Cold War from the 60s, but Russia has won the social media war, and it's used in, in the most brilliant information security way. It's used this brilliant system designed in a democracy, supposedly for the good of humanity, against us. So Facebook is now the biggest spewer of hate, uh, misogyny. Um, you know, the, the, the UN has classified some of the stuff happening in, in, in what was once called Burma as, as hate speech. And that's what's going on. Why do we recognize it? Because we see what it is. And why does Facebook not recognize it? Because they live in an ivory tower in Silicon Valley. And, and Mark Zuckerberg, I, I wrote a piece for the Financial Mail recently saying any other company in the world, Mark Zuckerberg would have been forced to resign. He only owns 16% of the stock, but he has 60% of the voting rights. It's, it's an extraordinary situation. So there's no accountability. And, and this has been widely documented. Uh, he has been saying sorry so, since he started doing anything. His very first uh, if, uh, a social media thing was called FaceMash, and it came out a year before he started Facebook, and it was basically a, a version of Am I Hot or Not? And he was immediately saying sorry. And there's a, there are numerous articles. Wired Magazine did a very good one of all the times he has said sorry for all the things he's done wrong, and yet that is exactly the same thing he said to Congress a couple of weeks ago. I'm sorry, we should have done better. It's all my mistake. I'm responsible. And then he says it's going to take, yesterday he said it's going to take three years to fix Facebook and they're already a year into it. Well, the damage is really being done. I mean, the thing that I find truly remarkable, and I, I shouldn't pick on Facebook because it turns out YouTube's pretty bad. YouTube, YouTube has algorithms that increasingly show you more and more extreme and more and more controversial things. Even when you're a kid, it will put adverts next to hate speech, uh, and it shows all sorts of, 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 um, of bad things to little children, but that's how they keep you hooked to the network. So Google's just as bad. Twitter has failed to police this online 
warfare against minorities, against women, against misogyny, against rape threats, against uh, any minority. Why? And they say, well, we didn't design the technology like that. Well, I suppose pitchforks were never designed to stick into people, but humanity is pretty good at that. That said, it's not always technology's fault. I have to kind of defend technology because it, what technology does is just show human nature in all of its terrible characteristics and it just shows us in more stark relief because you can you can see it much quicker and you can see the broad effects of it and when you have something like Facebook that reaches 2.2 billion people if you do something wrong it's like that you know if you go of course on a ship and you're one degree off and in 100 kilometers you're 10 degrees off what's happened is Facebook has gone awry and it's so far awry how is it possible to fix it you know, the first thing Zuckerberg could do if he truly wanted to do it was take such responsibility that he resigned, you know, but it, we're never going to see that and we're never going to see a fundamental change in their mindsets until something really significant happens. Thank you for that. So, be, yeah. Did that answer the question? That definitely answers the question. Thank you. Um, I think we could summarize it with Beyonce lyrics. In life, I believe pretty much anything can be summarized by Beyonce. But when she said, sorry, not sorry, that's basically what the tech guys are saying. Yeah. So, Prof, I'd like to ask you a double header before we open up to the floor for additional questions. AI has come up quite a bit in that, in algorithms, and that is um, your area of expertise. And so perhaps if you could speak a little bit about your latest work, its relevance to this conversation, and what it is an audience like this needs to be thinking about artificial intelligence and racism, but also in your role as an educator. One of the things that has come up repeatedly is the difficulty of the people who are creating this technology, who are monitoring it, who are meant to correct it, perhaps don't come from communities that many of the people in this room would come from, and so that there's a gap or a lack of knowledge about the realities of race and racism. How do we make tech spaces, how do we educate to make tech spaces more accessible to young people and to get more people working towards the vision that Tenmari was, was speaking about? Uh, no, no, thank you very much. Uh, when I came back to South Africa, uh, 18 years ago, after having completed a PhD in artificial intelligence, I was very excited. I never thought artificial intelligence was biased. But uh, last year, I went to, to Toyando. I come from Toyando in the northern part of this uh, country. And uh, because I have a large family, I actually used Airbnb to book myself. And the way you do, you put all your details, and it asks you for for the picture of, uh, for your ID and then it verifies your ID against whatever you have put and then it says uh, take a selfie <laughs> that was where the problem started <laughs> because it, it, it was matching my selfie to the picture in the ID it turns out that for African faces the algorithm does not work very very well <laughs> so I was quite uh, devastated <laughs> And then a few, few months back, uh, one of my deputies gave me a device that I can speak to. Oscar, I have, I have actually shown you this device. So I can ask it, so uh, how's the weather outside? Uh, play me to mami now uh, by Yuma Skela. And it does all that. Then I ask it, who is Chilizi Marwala? <laughs> Say, sorry, I do not understand you. So maybe there was a mistake, and I repeated it again, uh, and he still could not understand me. Then I say, who is the author of Skynet in the market? Then he said, Chile Zimarala with an American accent. I'm not lying. I, I tried to, to fake an American accent. I think I succeeded uh, at the 10th time. And uh, again, it almost reminded me of uh, a story about my grandfather, whom 80 years ago, uh, had to change his name from Chamano to Jack because his, uh, his boss could not be able to pronounce Chamano. So I was often, I was wondering if I had changed my name to Jack, perhaps it would be able to hear me. <laughs> so uh, all this actually indicate biases in all this. Why do we have biases on, uh, on this? It's because it turns out for the face recognition technology, 
The faces that are used to train this artificial intelligence were primarily gathered in North America and Europe. And therefore, uh, they, are, they are very good at uh, recognizing Caucasian faces, but they are quite bad at uh, recognizing African faces. Sounds like discrimination, isn't it? You know, uh, you know now, uh, traditionally in South Africa, especially now that we are at uh, the center of, of Madiba, uh, what kind of activists do we need to be able to fight this type of discrimination? Uh, Madiba used to, to organize demonstrations, defiance campaigns, and so on and so forth. Maybe that's not what we are supposed to do. Uh, what we are supposed to do is to get linguists for the speech recognition uh, tool, uh, engineers, scientists, basically a new type of activist who are there when these technologies are being made. I think that is actually quite uh, important. They have to be there, they have to be participants, and they also have to generate these technologies. They have to, we, if, if Facebook or if, uh, if, if, if Google is not uh, gathering information about us, it's probably our responsibility to, to start thinking about, not even just start thinking, actually to start doing. How do we cl close this gap to make sure that this thing does not repeat itself? I think that is quite uh, uh, crucial. The archives that uh, these data bases are acquiring are biased. You know, our languages are not represented. Uh, a few years ago, I, uh, when I was uh, still very active as a professor, uh, me and my student, uh, were, um, this must be 10 years ago, were de designing um, a piece of a machine that you speak to it in closer, and it is supposed to to translate it in, in, into English. And for a long time, it just never worked. <laughs> and then we found out that, no, the reason why it does not work is that closer is actually not one language, for those of you who are linguists. It's actually a combination of Bantu uh, languages, you know, and whenever uh, closer is not clicking, it sounds like any other Bantu language. And then it has these clicks. And these clicks, uh, uh, despite the stereotypes, are not frequent. Closer is actually not a clicking language. It clicks sometimes. So somebody will speak and then click. <laughs> and click. And the algorithm actually takes those clicks as noise. <laughs> and what does, it, what does it say to us is that we need to design algorithms that understand that uh, this language has clicks, and these clicks are not frequent. Uh, and Nolita, they are not frequent, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So what we need to do is uh, we need to educate. I think education is really the basis of all this. We need to educate people to be able to understand this. We need to understand, we need to educate in a multidisciplinary fashion. The idea of technologists uh, designing speech uh, translation system without linguists is problematic. And if we are going to educate engineers who only understand engineering, and then they don't understand culture, they don't understand language, then what we are going to have, we are going to have these devices that are probably biased because the people who are designing them simply do not have the expertise to be able to deal with uh, uh, you know, uh, its usage holistically. You know, because when you deploy technology, you, de you deploy it in society. And unless our graduates understand uh, uh, society, then they are not going to be able to design better uh, products. And I think that is very, very key. And uh, as South Africa, we, we, we are not very good at multidisciplinarity. We tend to like to educate engineers who only know about engineering. It's important for us to educate engineers who understand language, who understand, who, who read um, uh, uh, literature, who understand art, 
so that whenever they they become um, use, uh, designers of these devices, they're going to design them holistically. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna um, pass it over to Rashida, but then also open the floor. So while that mic is being passed down, if you could indicate if you have questions, we'll take three questions at once. I see a hand somewhere in the back there. One, two, three, and then I'm gonna come to this side of the room in the next round. Yeah, I just want to make a quick note um, about the wariness around improving technology that allows for better surveillance of our communities. Um, so things like facial recognition software that's in America at least used to surveil and to um, criminalize us in, in many ways or um, the types of websites or things that extract information from our communities that we then no longer have access to or control over. Um, when you make technology better able to do that, I, I, I get really concerned about it. So I think there needs to be a balance there, of course, for people who, you know, for your story that you said, people who want to use Airbnb and, and things like that, it's an issue. Discrimination is, is certainly an issue, but on the other side of that, creating technologies that make it easier to surveil us, which is a huge, huge, it's, it's extremely pervasive in our communities, especially our radical communities, our activist communities, um, um, you know, the, the folks who are on the black identity extremist list, these, these, these technologies make it that much easier to mark us, identify us, extract us, um, extract information, gel us. Um, and just a quick show of hands, how many people have heard about or are familiar with this of the black identity extremist? No one. Okay. Tenmori, if you could just give a quick word just so that we have some context since we are having a cross-cultural conversation. And then I'm coming to those hands. So in the United States, um, particularly after the war on terror, there was different labels um, to basically start um, the surveillance of domestic populations in the United States. So the first surveillance, the and this is part of a longer history, I would argue that the history of the United States is the control of black and brown bodies. So I don't think it just starts with 9-11. It starts really with the lantern laws um, that happened in the beginning of the country where, you know, slaves had to walk with candles um, at night, otherwise they would be um, uh, whipped for being out without a slave pass. Um, but in, in, in response to um, the black identity extremism, it comes from this like new brand of laws that have been looking at how to look at who is a terrorist. So countering violent extremism was the first of these programs. It was targeted at Muslim communities and was first kind of trialed through US aid programs in Pakistan and Afghanistan and then done domestically on Muslim communities in the US. And then recently be, through a revelation of different reporting, um, since 2015 they've also been surveilling black communities. And they use the label black identity extremism to name anyone who is working towards black liberation. And that definition is not by um, people who are saying this from a self-determined autonomous space. It's actually however the FBI determines it. And, and given the, the danger of what this means is that we know that um, in the past when um, the United States has surveilled black and brown bodies, um, you know, there was a project called COINTELPRO, which some folks may be aware of. Um, people were disappeared, people were murdered, um, and there was dissension put between different movements to break up the power of liberatory movements that were happening. And it's the same thing with CVE, uh, because you, you have Muslim groups being paid money to self-surveil and also people being put into jail um, and oftentimes in these like very mysterious courts uh, where so you will have representation but you don't know what your crimes are. People will be put into communications units and not heard of and, 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 and really entrapped um, uh, by um, FBI and Department of Homeland Security forces. So it's a very dangerous precedent to now see that entire apparatus, which is based on fake psychology and white supremacist hysteria, now being turned and extended to black liberation movements. And I think it's a very disturbing you know, um, sign of things to come. So just to, for those who are not experts in this area, basically let's say I go to a, a Black Lives Matter march or a march against police brutality or community meeting that the state deems to be problematic, I can be labeled a black identity extremist and then tried in particular ways that really have nothing to do and they use facial recognition to pick up where you were. So that's, those are the, some of the very, and these are things that I think the first person was recently tried in the US as a black identity extremist. So these are not 
hypotheticals. These are things that are actually happening right now in the U.S. and most likely will be exported to other places. The first hand that was in the back, the gentleman, yes, with the glasses, the gentleman with the glasses is first, and then. Oh, yeah. hi. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, so, uh, Please tell us your name. Name is uh, Sinatemba. Sinatemba. Yeah. So uh, I'm just looking at this whole activism and technology possibly potentially becoming racist, because th that's what we're talking about, is that the technology is created by Westerners, and it inherently has a bias against black and brown people, simply put, right? So, as Africans, right, historically, we've always been known to complain, okay? We march, we burn the stuff, we protest, and all this other stuff, you know? Sinatama, just hold the mic up a little more. So okay, sure. So, with the fourth industrial revolution upon us right now, right, we have to recall that every other preceding revolution, okay, we've inherited. So we were laborers in the first industrial revolution, we were laborers and consumers in the second one, the third one, and so on, okay? Now, as the prof has already said, it's not gonna happen that we're gonna march against artificial intelligence, it's not gonna happen that we're gonna march against machines. Okay, it's counterproductive, it's stupid, it makes us look stupid. So okay. what's your question, Tanatamba? So my question is, we have to look beyond, we have to look at the conditions that enable a Facebook, you know. Would it have worked if Zuckerberg was a student at Vets and he came up with this application? Would it have been as big? So is our South African society enabling enough for such innovation? And are we as a country ready for the fourth industrial revolution to be able to participate? Would an Elon Musk, had he had stayed in Pretoria and not gone to Canada and to America, would he have still built these weird and wonderful things and generated all this revenue for his country and tax base and would have employed all these people? So, so if let's I can not just finger point, like my, my, my point is, let's not finger point, because now we're going to end up being stupid and blaming machines and blaming technology. So, Sinatamba, if I could just, because we have a lot of people with okay, hands I'm up, very so sorry. if I could just summarize, because I think yes, you're please. making an important intervention. Great. So, is the environment enabling for the type of innovation we want to see? To participate okay. in the fourth industrial revolution and can we, okay. can we fully participate having skipped the first, the second, and the third? Gotcha. Thank you. To the lady with the poppin' lipstick, please tell us your name and your question. Not a lady, but it's cool. So I'll take I, that. I'm very sorry. <laughs> that was a, problem, a very poor a assumption for me to make. I apologize. Uh, hi, my name is Terrence. Uh, this is a question to the panel and everybody here. And I've been thinking what they're saying, it brings me back to a personal conversation I had with myself in the car. And I think a lot of us do that. Where in the beginning, you'd go on Google Maps and it was funny, the pronunciation of street names. But now it's tiring. I'm tired. And... I want them pronounced correctly, firstly for myself and anybody that I'm traveling with to know the correct pronunciation. And I was sitting there in my car and I'm like, imagine an American, an English person coming to South Africa and driving a car and putting an address and hearing all these weird names that I can't even understand. I have to hear it three times that it's WF and Como, WF and Como, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it must repeat it three times in order for me to get it. How interesting it would be if you're in a car and if you're from America and you hear WF and Como and you get out of the car, you go to your place and you ask who is WF and Como and you pronounce it correctly because you've heard it three times in the car before you get to the destination. Instead of coming in and saying WF and Como or whatever the, it says, you know? So my question is, I, I'm sure there is a market for Google. Uh, how many people here have Google Maps? All of us. So already South Africa is a big market. Mm. And these corporations like Google Africa and Facebook Africa have offices in Africa. How do we mobilize ourselves to say enough is enough, we want the correct things? It starts with the small things. Before we even go on the big 
uh, what she was saying of policing and uh, gathering information and making sure that algorithms are correct and all of that. How do we start with the small things? How do we mobilize ourselves in this room to say, I'm going to hand out a piece of paper, give me your name and your email, I'm going to start a petition, we're going to send it to Google Africa and say, we want somebody, we want Azania to record correct street names, please. And can it come out in the next three months? Excellent. How do we do that? How do we do that? So how do we, so how do we take so we've identified the problems? How do we move towards the solution? How do we mobilize? As the professor Activism said, that here. how do we mobilize? How do we uh, become activists in that? Starting with that small thing of it seems small, but it's a big thing. Excellent. To have your name pronounced correctly. Thank you, Terrence. Thank you. Uh, there was someone. There was a hand in the very last row. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Clifford Peter. Uh, I just want to start by defining the word technology. I learned this thing when I was doing grade 8. They say it's the way we use our knowledge uh, to solve our practical problems. Coming to the fourth industrial revolution, Prof, uh, I, ca I can just start by saying thank you for thinking of including us as, as South Africans on the process. Uh, when you speak of the first industrial revolution, Obviously, that's when they created the issues of locomotions, trains, and everything. Second, electricity. Third, computers, internet. And then we were the object, like you mentioned in your statement. So now we want to be the subjects of the fourth industrial revolution. I just want to give examples of what's happening. And then a lot of people are afraid that you're going to be losing our jobs. If we had to look at how jobs are lost, let me just give you a practical example. Which one I'm also going to ask because we do need to come to the other hand. So yes, yes. We I, I just want to, I'm going to do this. Okay. One thing that is happening is that normally companies do, do come to South Africa to make money. Ne? Like if you had to check, we lost a company in with bank. They call it a high felt that used to produce steel. And then that company was lost to a Chinese companies which came with a products that are sold in cheaper prices, which tells us that actually this thing has to do with what? With a skill. So when you speak of the fourth industrial revolution, that's when we are saying that as South Africans, we are going to be the ones de heading that project. Meaning that when you're speaking about it competing with jobs, we are the ones that they are going to say, a robot is going to be the one. By the way, I saw a device. They say the device, they can use it. The device tells the police that at this time, this place, there's going to be an incident that's going to be happening of robbery of this nature. Then they use that device to go and do this thing and attack those criminals. So if you are to think, if we had that skill ourselves and going to challenge the world and going to send those criminals, I think it's something that we need. So actually, what I wanted to say is that I see future in the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll hand over to the panel, and if I could just summarize the three uh, questions. Uh, so this issue, and perhaps, Prof, we can begin with you, this idea of do we have an env enabling uh, environment, and how do we ensure inclusion in the process of the creation of this technology? And then we'll come to Toby and anyone else who would like to, to weigh in, and particularly the question, Terrence's question about mobilizing for change. No, thank you very much. I think I just need to first uh, put it, uh, uh, put it uh, forward that technology, any technology can be used for good and it can be used for bad. Whether it is nuclear technology, you can use nuclear for, to generate electricity, you can use it to generate nuclear bomb that can destroy uh, uh, all of us. So uh, we need to make choices as, as society uh, 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 to make sure that uh, uh, we maximize the, the responsible use of technology and eliminate the irresponsible use of technology. Now, how do we... What, what, what needs to be done? What is to be done? I think politically, we need support. Our politicians must understand these technologies. I think it is very, very key. If, if we are talking about artificial intelligence and you go and take a straw poll uh, 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 amongst our parliamentarians and you find out that uh, less than 10% even know what you're talking about. That's then, then we have a problem. So, uh, 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 politically, we need support, and we need awareness. They need to understand what is what is going on. Socially, 
we need to participate. All of us have a role to play. All of us, uh, uh, I'm not a very active member of Facebook, uh, not as active as you, Salom. <laughs> but, uh, but certainly, you know, uh, when you see things that you don't like, you need to do something about it. I don't know what, what it is, you know. Uh, you can report it, uh, you know, you can, you can write about it uh, because this, uh, these companies are very, very sensitive of, 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 of bad publicity in, in any media. You know, so we need to be we need we need to be active. We need to be activist. We need to be vigilant, and and, and we need to to be louder when we are disapproving whatever we see. Economically, I think we need to invest. Uh, currently, at South, at South Africa, we invest less than one percent of our GDP on research and development. I mean, less than one percent. It basically means that. We do not invest in research and development. And if we do not invest in research and development, what is going to happen is that the patent of control that we saw during the times of colonization are simply going to perpetuate. I think it is very, very important. And finally, it is quite clear that if we are not vigilant, Harold Woolpe used to talk about uh, colonization of a special kind. You know, that uh, these technologies are going to bring to us colonization of a special kind. And, and that colonization will be very difficult to fight because it will be so much part of us that we, we will think it is us. That's a very good point because it, what it's going to do is 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 just continue the same uh, patterns of behaviour and the same patterns of prejudice going forward. So um, to answer the first question, how did something like Facebook happen, and why did it happen there, and not here? Well, firstly, Facebook came about 15 years ago, where. Uh, internet access was hugely prevalent on American campuses, on college campuses, um, and it there was a ready-made audience for that kind of, of ease of use technology, and they had free internet access. S the same thing happened with, with Net Napster, which was music sharing. It became easy and possible to do it to a very captive audience who have now become used to not paying for the things that that technology has. I'm often asked that question, why don't we have a Silicon Valley like innovative culture in South Africa? And the problem is, is, is for once, it's not really the government's fault, um, although in general I do like to blame government. Um, the problem is the cost of airtime because the, the, the smartphone, the, the computer of today is most people's smartphones. And the, 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 the way technology is creating ivory towers or, or 1% is, is depending on what quality phone you have, which means your experience of the phone will be different. Most people don't understand that the touch screen alone can differentiate whether you'll have a good experience or a bad experience. If you touch the phone and it responds or it doesn't respond, then the cost of airtime, whether you have good or, or bad internet access. I, I feel kind of apologetic that I have fiber at home and fiber at the work. It, it kind of makes me feel like I'm the internet 1%. I have blisteringly fast internet access. I can do things most other people can't do and that's not most people's experience. Most youngsters in South Africa are not thinking about how can I share video on the internet, which is how YouTube came about. How can I share photographs on my mobile phone, which is how Instagram came about. How can I send safe and secure messages to someone else, which is what WhatsApp, came, uh, WhatsApp did. Instead, most of our youth are terrified that they're going to run out of data, or they are completely concerned with how they, are, they can stay online without doing data. So their focus is in the wrong place. Their focus is a state of scarcity. How do I not run out of this precious commodity as opposed to how do I do something wonderful with what I've got? And even though it seems like a good thing, all of these social uh, social packages that networks offer, I saw one the other day, what's a gig's worth of WhatsApp for 10 Rand. And people say, that's great, that means I can WhatsApp. What it means is you can only WhatsApp. 
you know, there's been a lot of kickback against uh, Facebook Lite and, and Wikipedia Zero, and the reason is, it's a walled garden. That's what AOL, the very first big online uh, internet provider in America did. It created a walled garden, which means you're stuck in the garden that someone else created. That is, by its very nature, discriminatory. Um, so what we need is, is a way to break out of that. And there's this wonderful story of these, these guys in, uh, 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 guys, girls, kids in Angola. And what they did is they used closed Facebook groups. So they used Facebook Lite that gave you, you know, free surfing within this closed environment. And Wikipedia Zero, which was free surfing within the Wikipedia. And they used it to, to trade pirated TV shows and movies. So that's just a great example of the ingenuity of the of the constraints of the system and they found this way to use the constraints of the system to you know do something illegal which is what I suppose the internet always is good at you know the the, the great file sharing stuff that happened with Napster which is which is you know illegal um, but I don't, I just want to say there's some really good stuff coming out of Africa we have we have no capacity we have no access to these fast technologies so the things that come out of it it's called innovation out of necessity or frugal innovation and the stuff that we see is really fantastic. And PESA has come along and become the greatest example of mobile money. I always ask my friends who live in the States or Europe, have you ever used Apple Pay or Google Pay or Samsung Pay? Has anyone ever used any of these technologies? And most people haven't. But everybody in Kenya uses M-Pesa. M-Pesa is a technology that emerged out of constraint. And it has been really fantastic. So that's the first level of innovation. The next level of innovation that's come on top of mobile money, and just by the way, half of all mobile money services in the world are in Africa, and that's because we only have cell phones, but but because we only have cell phones, we, we are a mobile only continent, we innovate around that brilliantly. A whole bunch of service providers now sell solar kits. Mkopa in, in Kenya is the best example. One of the co-founders is one of the co-founders of Mpesa. They sell you a solar kit and the simple logic of, and, and what underpins it is the, the right kind of business logic. They looked at how much people would spend on paraffin or illuminating fluid for the year. It's about $200. You pay a, a upfront deposit and every day you pay 53 Kenyan shillings which is about three American cents and after a year you've paid off the solar kit the kit is a, is a battery it's a panel to put on the roof it's two uh, lights, LED lights. It's a it's a torch. Whenever I say this in America, I have to say flashlight, because no one in America knows what a torch is. A and a portable rechargeable radio. And after a year, people own the technology, and they can use it to charge their phones at night. They can charge their neighbours to charge their phones. And that's the kind of clever, innovative thinking out of constraints, out of frugality that we're starting to see in Africa. So. Uh, um, it's, it's the way that, you, you know, we solve real problems. To answer your question, Silicon Valley is solving things, the New York Times once said, solving things for kids who move out of home that their mothers used to do for them. You know, food delivery and, and washing. I mean, you know this great example of the of the of the blender, the seven hundred dollar blender um, that you could just squeeze the bag with your hand. You know, the juicer. So, so what we're seeing is real problems. The innovation in Africa solves real problems, and they turn out to be the problems the rest of the world faces. So, when we solve them here, we solve them for the rest of the world. Thanks. If we could pass that down to Musa, who wanted to make a comment, but I'm glad you brought in other African examples. Um, in a couple of days, uh, the AU has caught on to this, and the AU Trade Commission is actually hosting a hackathon and conference with 70 of Africa's 400 startups to begin to look at exactly these issues. How do we create policy frameworks that really enable um, startups to thrive, but not only startups, generally speaking, but pro-poor startups that really focus on the type of solutions that totally is speaking about. Yeah, I think I'm very encouraged by um, you know the desire for people to innovate and to be um, part of the fourth industrial re revolution that's occurring everywhere in the world. And but I think it's also important to keep in mind in the framework of our discussion about race and technology that um, uh, all these companies that we're talking about. Um, so Google owns YouTube, um, Facebook. Apple and um, and Amazon. These are these are some of the largest companies in the world, um, and 
they are platform companies and they are taking advantage of something that's intrinsic. It's the lifeblood of this fourth industrial revolution, which is data. And they, they've been able to accumulate an unassailable advantage in data. And I think um, sort of baked into that reality is that just like you said about facial recognition, you know, this, this lead that companies like Facebook have in facial recognition is, is essentially unassailable because they have a picture of over a billion people which they can use to, to train artificial intelligence algorithms to allow them to recognize faces. And that's proprietary, that's what they own. And that, that's what makes it possible for them to monetize those advantages. And I think in, in this framework of whether we're gonna be objects or subjects of the fourth industrial revolution, um, I think for me the ultimate part of the revolution is biology. Like how much of your biology are you gonna understand and how much of your genetics are you going to understand? And and actually, it's a it's a huge disadvantage for people who are in the global south, especially in Africa, because very little is understood, right? But it's also a huge advantage if you look at it the other way, because this is an opportunity for actually us to take control of this data and to learn more about it and to build a different type of unassailable advantage in that area. But those advantages are, are few, and, and I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a Chinese company called SenseTime, which uh, in China has over 170 million CCTV cameras that are controlled by the government. And SenseTime works with the Chinese government and has been able to basically use all 170 million of these CCTV cameras to train their deep learning algorithms to recognize Chinese faces. They have the most powerful facial recognition algorithms in the world today. And um, they use that just, they, and, uh, you know, whatever your, I'm being completely amoral about this, right? But whatever the way you want to think about this, you can think how terrifying because, you know, all they need is like a, a, a sliver of my face through the window of a car and they'll so know it's me through a camera, through a CCTV camera or, you could think of it another way, which is like, well, they, I guess SenseTime just did a valuation and they're worth $5 billion and they're able to, to raise all kinds of money and none of us have heard about it, right? But it's sort of an intrinsic thing that people in China have done. So wherever your politics lie in terms of what kind of economy you want to see, some people are very neoliberal and they think everybody should have, you know, make as much money as they want and some people believe that there should be regulation. Wherever you fall on these things, Technology is going to arbitrate, and techno capitalism, unfortunately, I think will win. And the question we have to ask all of ourselves is, well, how do you want to participate in that future, right? And and I don't think we're going to win a sort of techno communist or techno socialist world. That that I don't think is going to happen. I think we're going to have to be a lot more robust in the way we want to compete against these platform economies, and we're gonna to have to leverage the things where we know we have an advantage in terms of data gathering and artificial intelligence in many domains to be able to, to really overcome what I think are gonna be um, structural, deep and irreversible structural barriers that are gonna exist in this fourth industrial revolution. I'm going to come back to the audience. I noted the hand of the person in the red head wrap, and I think there was another question. Yeah, this gentleman here, and then the person there. So we can there. Hello, I'm Nazreen Ibrahim. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Nazreen Ibrahim. Thanks to our teachers on the panel. Uh, a lot of topics were discussed, so thank you for that. It's given me more to think about, like gender identity, accessibility. Um, but we're talking racism and in the digital age. So in that, that connecting thread through everything that we talk about is humanity, because that's how I think about human beings, right? But why don't we have increased cultural empathy, and how can we increase that? Because that's what seems to be always missing uh, in every conversation we have and what seems to be the point of contention among people who are of different race, uh, different type, or different whatever you want to have. Thank you. 
so increased cultural um, empathy. That reminds me actually of something Steve Biko said when he said the great powers of the world may have done wonders in giving the world an industrial and military look, but the great gift still has to come from Africa, giving the world a more human face. And so perhaps our panel can reflect on that when we come back to them. Okay. Thank you. My name is Audrey Gatawa. So um, my thoughts and perhaps a question too are that um, in the quest to combat racism, we need to avoid uh, politicizing technology, because I think that's something that's quite um, potentially dangerous. So for example, society does not necessarily share the same view on very important fo uh, foundational issues, and that doesn't make people on either side of the belief um, um, sphere good or evil. So my concern is that um, the drive to regulate or, or police social media, for example, seems to be driven by a more liberal perspective. So hence there are growing concerns that conservative voices are being disproportionately targeted by exactly the type of measures that are arguably important to create safe spaces on these platforms. So I guess what I really want to clarity from the panelists is how do we go about advocating to um, or what, what do you suggest as solutions to combat racism without descending into um, censorship? Thank you for that question. Yes. Thank you. My name is Graham Bailey, and I'm very pleased to hear that the clauses have a problem with voice recognition because I'm, I'm from Glasgow. <laughs> Um, I believe that technology has already been politicized. On every Tuesday, the president in the White House, including Obama, used to have a meeting with his security people. And despite all the rights that are imbued in the American Constitution about the right to a free to a trial and to be accused and to defend, they list the people they are going to assassinate that they can pick up by voice recognition when they use a cell phone. And everyone in this room who gets their medical aid from Discovery, how many? Show hands, I can't see. <laughs> Every time you phone in, Discovery is recording your, Toby, your voice. They're, sto they're storing it. We already know that data is being massively misused without public consent. Facial recognition in China, no voice recognition. For the activist community, I believe that we have to develop a massive protest to redefine the rights of privacy and freedom. As our constitutions defined in Western democracies, they, they say we have the right to freedom and the right to privacy. All of these have been redefined by technology. We, re to, we need to redefine these definitions legally so that the technology companies can't misuse our data for their purposes. Then Mori or Rashida, would you like to pick up that point? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'll probably just pass it to you. I, I just think for myself, and perhaps I'm liberal or biased, but I, censorship is not my concern. You know, especially when um, people are being hurt, violated, violence comes from what's said and done on Facebook and in these spaces. Um, so censorship falls a little bit below for me in terms of what I'm prioritizing for people. I want people to be safe. Um, I, I work with domestic violence survivors and Facebook is constantly used as a tool to terrorize survivors and, and, and victims. Um, and again, I could go on and on and, and again, the example that I, that 
you highlighted earlier around black identity extremists being tracked and surveilled through Facebook. So it's, and as you said, it's already politicized. It's, this is not the doing of people who are kind of like speaking to this. It, it's already been done. Um, and so I, I think, you know, kind of going back to your point about cultural empathy and, and reframing these things, it's like, what are we prioritizing when we're talking about humans? Are we prioritizing the right to say what you want, regardless of, of what it does to people or how it hurts and violates and, and creates violence? Um, or are we prioritizing, what are we prioritizing? So. Um, I can speak to this uh, from the U.S. context. Um, I think that when conservatives are talking about being censored on Facebook, it's a big old nothing burger. Um, and I think it's a distraction to really hide from the fact that you have key members of the administration, Steve Bannon, for example, who are investors and are on the board of Cambridge Analytica, and that the conversation we should be having is not about censorship, but about how a U.K. firm basically tested their election engineering practices on countries in the global south. That includes elections in Nigeria, in Kenya, in India, and that it wasn't just Cambridge Analytica and Facebook was innocent. Facebook also has an election engineering team. And they worked with despots like Modi, who is the Prime Minister of India, and basically they allowed a genocidal murderer to now become president of one of the largest, um, um, Prime Minister of one of the largest um, democracies in the world. And it's been chaos ever since. So I think that when we talk about censorship, we're actually distracting from the way that we've seen these social platforms basically hijack and hack our democracies. And the fact that we are not able to have that conversation with full transparency by both countries, um, by, you know, by both companies is the real problem. Um, but I also want to speak to the question about vision, which is what we spoke about earlier, is that I think this is a moment to not just hold these corporate platforms accountable. We do need to build that next generation of activists. And I think that activists work on problems because they are problem solvers. They see something wrong socially and they protest, they develop policies, they move a vision of the world no matter how hard the structural problem. That's also what technologists do. And I think what we need to do is empower everyone to, to recognize we're actually all technologists. Some of us might work in laboratories. Some of us might be, you know, kitchen technologists and working in terms of cooking recipes that come from many years back or fabric technologists. But what we need to empower is this innovation mindset that allows us to be able to build the infrastructures so we no longer have to import technology from the global north. That requires investment in STEM education, not just investment investment and innovation. It makes no sense to have hackathons if all the hackathons are filled with only cis men. We need to be able to invest and create um, a gender diverse and centering marginalized voices because those of us who are at the frontiers of violence will also know how to create for not only our own safety but the safety of many. And so I think that investment is really crucial. And also I think that we need more than just technologists to be able to that are able to be trained um, in multiple disciplines. We also need multiple disciplines to be trained in technology. I come to this conversation conversation as an artist. The reason why I entered the conversation as a technologist was because I was targeted on a technological platform. But can I code? Yes, absolutely. And the thing that I want to just emphasize is that when we look at the models of technology that are coming out of the North, they reflect a dominator culture um, mindset. So for example, when you look at the, um, the development of robots, Robots, all of the robots that we see Global North companies develop are robots to take up the positions of servants and slaves. We have sex robots. We have robots that are there for the military. Robots to take up um, very difficult, like, um, assembly line jobs. But there's this really incredible book by this roboticist from Japan called The Buddha and the Robot. And he talks about what would be a what would be a robot that came out of a culture in which we viewed the the creation both from like an internal um, computing perspective, but that was our peer as opposed to a worker or a servant underneath that. The fact that we're simply creating tools that perpetuate dominator culture means we also need philosophers. Can I just follow up on that point really quick to say that 
along those lines, I reject this idea that technology is neutral. I mean, unless you're talking about the pure technology of nature itself and what nature has produced, technology is made by people and people are not neutral. I mean, they're, they're you know, it, it can be used for good or evil as we, we all acknowledge, but it's made by people and, and people aren't neutral. And I think that's the mistake that we also fall into with science and, and thinking of science and scientists as neutral. They're not neutral. They're, they're people. Yeah, no, 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 thanks. I, I, I agree that uh, uh, technology is, you know, is made by, by humans. And uh, whenever you have human relations, um, politics comes into the picture. So our responsibility is not to try to eliminate politics. Our responsibility is to encourage responsible uh, 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 politics. I think that is quite important. And what do we need to do? I think uh, you know we, we have invested huge amounts of money developing algorithms, but what we have not done was to invest uh, in the ethics of technology, the ethics of artificial intelligence. Uh, very little work has been done in that area. Uh, we understand why, because uh, from a business perspective, Maybe ethics of technology is not going to, to sell more than the gadgets of technology, you know. And I think uh, we need to change the mindset. I, I want to respond to Trevor, because I, I hear you with a name like Toby Shapshack. I've had it mispronounced my whole life. There's actually a very in interesting initiative being run by, of all people, Nando's, about say my name or spell my name. Very controversially, there was a story on the front page of the Sunday Times, I think last month, where they had the little red underline as if you, got, you know, misspelt it. So there is something being done there, because I, I, I agree with you. But the problem is, how do you create that database? And it's for this reason that I won't use an Amazon Echo. You know that Amazon Echo is this, that uses the Alexa voice assistant records every single thing you say every single thing you say. And people have this fallacious misunderstanding where they say, I've got nothing to hide. The I've got nothing to hide is not a good excuse. You, the thing you're giving up is your privacy. You know, I mean, the science fiction stories often come come to you know come to fruition much later on, and and there were you know uh, science fiction or fiction fiction esque stories about you know Amazon Echo records being being subpoenaed so that they could hear how a murder happened. Well, that's happening now. There are court cases, so um, it's it's a fallacy, but it's a bit of a, a two edged sword, right? As we were discussing about selfies in 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 uh, in in Airbnb, if you have a database of, of people's faces and how you can recognize people's faces, it can be used for nefarious means. Um, and to f your, your question about censorship, I just love that liberals, us liberals, are the only people worried about censorship, right? So the alt-right, I don't know why we call them the alt-right, they're fascists and racists, let's use the words. Um, they don't argue about censorship. The only reason they're arguing about censorship or not being able to talk about it because they have to, you know, discuss where they're going to beat people up in a different context. The only problem in terms of censorship is that if you if you shut them down, they're going to hide somewhere even more nefarious and carry on doing the things they are. I would also add with that is that when you look at the right wing, they're so much more ambitious and funded to be more ambitious than we're allowed to be in progressive spaces. So in the United States, um, you know, you saw um, Nazis basically being kicked off of Facebook on Twitter and a fundraising platform called Patreon. What they did was, was like, we don't, that's fine. They just built their own alternatives. So there's an alternative right-wing um, Facebook called WrongThink and an alternative Twitter called Gab.ai. And they even have their own fundraising platform called Patreon. Um, Patreon. Um, and, this is, uh, and what's remarkable about that is because they built their own platform that was based on Bitcoin, many of these Nazis are also now Bitcoin millionaires. 
So I think that the, the need to be able to invest in our own innovation is necessity. It's really absolutely not an option. And the Hindu right in India also takes this very seriously. When you look at the, the Silicon Valley of India, it is actually dominantly made up of upper caste Hindu fundamentalists. They control all of the venture capital workflows, and they are the majority of all of the major kind of unicorn startups that are coming up in India. So we must develop. We must create create at this moment, um, otherwise we will be um, seeing ourselves like indentured within this next system. But I, I do want to just um, say that I do believe that there is a possibility outside of techno-capitalism because that's, I feel like we, if we only create within the, the model of which we continue to see extraction of ourselves, our bodies, our lands, then we are going to um, be in a limited ecosystem. And I think that we, if, if the next billion internet users can't change it, then no one will. And and if the and if the current engineers who can't think past that, who are primarily cis men, can't think about that, then let the women lead, let the gender queer folks lead. Let us take the reins for a little bit, and let's see if we can come outside of techno capitalism. And I think something that is coming out of this conversation uh, very strongly, and it seems as if we maybe danced around it in the beginning, is this idea that technology is neutral, right? But that it was created by many people with a very specific purpose, right? Whether it was Mark Zuckerberg and wanting to have extracurriculars in his dorm room with the ladies, right? Um, there was a particular purpose um, and that sometimes the purpose is really reinforcing existing biases, existing forms of exclusion. And I think to the point that Musa raised earlier, just around the, the creation of the idea of race, right? That that is still something that very much carries through in terms of AI. It very much carries through in terms of technology. And it seems that the panel is saying we can't afford to be neutral because it never was neutral to begin with. Can I take the last round of questions? One, two. You know what? Because we've not had a lot of gender balance, I'm gonna take one, there was a hand here, and then this lady in the glasses. And you fine gentlemen, afterwards, I'm sure the panel would be happy to answer your questions directly. Thanks, my name's Oscar. I just, I mean, it seems to me, you know, there are two ways that, that the global north is dealing with this um, in terms of a challenge. The one is indigenization. And so Japan, China, and a number of other countries in Europe says that we need to indigenize. It needs to be in our language. We want to see Google. We will input into Google what we want to get out of it. So they indigenize. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that Europe does the regulation path because it's English, they're comfortable with it, but they want to regulate. And so they have lots of regulations in terms of Google, Amazon, etc., etc. And so it seems to me that I agree that technology is way past not being political. What we need to then do as the Global South, is, and, and, and I, when I listen to you guys, there's some variance of disagreements amongst you as well in terms of approaches and so on. What is required is some thinking around a common approach to how we're going to deal with this, especially also because in terms of the third world or the global south, we are captive, we are a captive market. So if we get the X10 phone, we are already knowing that there's the X12, but we have to first spend the money on the X10. So we forever, we are behind the curve all the time, and we are so excited with this new technology. Uh, but actually, we're just being captive. And so, we don't have the money. We can't combat. I mean, you've seen just a few days ago, the, the UK government has put a billion pounds in terms of Imperial College towards AI. And we've now seen that China has put 2.1 billion, uh, made 2.1 billion US dollars available in terms of artificial intelligence. So we can't compete with that. So my only request from the activists are that there needs to be a coherent mission in terms of this is what's wrong and the, therefore the response needs to be coordinated and we think the response is X, Y, Z. So when we talk of the billion, the next billion, we need to give them a program and an agenda about how we're going to tackle this with our limited resources. Thanks. Thank you. So a program of action, if you will. 
And then the question that was over here. Um, this is directed towards you. Rashida. Sorry, your name? Just, oh, sorry, my name is Amo. Um, just in the discussion of sort of the discussions towards solutions or responses, cultivating our own incentives and innovations towards a response towards the all-knowing, all-seeing techno-capital, white techno-capital. Um, I just wanted you to speak on Afrofuturism because I find it fascinating as sort of a new, a new way to think of black identity intersecting with technology. So if you could just speak on that. Great question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Buit Dumelo. I think both my points relate a bit to what Oscar was saying, and that is how do you develop national and regional policies that deal with global technology? Um, and then I think that would go back to the discussions around ethics, because ethics have got cultural nuances to them, yet we're using global technologies that are not owned, say, by South Africans or by Africans. That's my first question. My second question really has to do with who's developing technology. In my previous life, I worked in a room with developers. I was the only one wearing high heels. I was the only one of my skin color. And I left the profession because you can't defend when you're outnumbered. So how do you drive minority into the rooms when the capital doesn't belong to us? And therefore, the vision is not ours. And the problems, I have to explain my problem three, four, five times before something has to be developed to sort out my health issue because somebody doesn't understand what a black woman would suffer from. So, yeah. Thank you for that. And I think just in responding, if the panel could also speak to specific resources, because again, we said we wanted this to be the start of a conversation and it seems like people want to begin to take tangible action or additional places that they can go to, go to learn more about some of the issues that we have spoken about. So I'm gonna, ask, ten, I'm gonna ask Tenmori to begin and Rashida, for you to finish up with uh, Afrofuturism the rest of the panel has an opportunity to weigh in. So I think that, you know, one thing that I always say is that localization, which is the term that tech companies use to, to adapt to a particular market, is an anagram for colonization. Because basically, as soon as you localize for Google, um, you're trapped into the Google ecosystem. You don't really, you're not really then being able, and you basically give up on your own innovation pipeline for those same problems. And I think, you know, when these, when these companies are so big and so vast, it feels really intimidating to think beyond localization as a way, particularly with limited resources. But I, I think what we need to do is take the long view and think about what would it take to create an innovation ecosystem from, um, from the crib all the way up into university. So for example, um, when you think about how Apple was developed, Apple was developed by two by two guys in their garage that had access to, that had access to cheap um, electronics to develop the personal computer. And one of the things that I thought that was so interesting about thinking about the term personal computer is that, of course, that is only the form of technology that would have been developed in the United States. Because the assumption is everyone has their own piece of equipment. Whereas, let's imagine those same two people in a village in India. Um, you would never think of one person using an equipment. You would think of maybe something that would have like uh, multiple users using multiple mouses in one interface. Maybe it would have been the village computer, the VC that would have come out. So being able to orient around technology at the point of need for us means we have to create a new generation of thinkers that are able to be facile with lots of different technology, but from a place of play. So imagine if every village, if every township had access to a hacker space that people could start to innovate at the point of need in their immediate ways. Maybe figuring out ways to like rewire the, the electricity because the electricity isn't coming because of brownouts. Or thinking about the way to use sol solar panels. People are already doing that already because we have to innovate around poverty. But what if we were innovating around things that we would want to move forward? And I think that that's, that to me is where I think the power of movements like Afrofuturism are from, is that it helps us think outside of the box of the current colonial limitations of techno-capitalism to, to be able to dream about our own self-determination and autonomy. And I think we should never give up on that dream as we start to deal with the immediate crises of what we're seeing as we see all of this like um, imported technology of the North because it'll limit our innovation possibilities. 
did because uh, I wanted to end with Rashida and Afrofuturism. I don't know if uh, Toby or the VC or Musa wanted to weigh in on any of these points. I, I hear you what, you what you're saying about being in that kind of context because I grew up in this matriarchal community. I mean, it's the great thing about being Jewish is that women really do run the world in the Jewish community. They're just really good at making the men think they do. It's kind of like that great line from my big fat Greek wedding. The man is the head of the family, but who do you think is the neck? Um, so I I hear that and I, and I, I mean, if you've got a really good burning idea and you, th you think you know you can solve it, they're great VCs who really want to fund that kind of stuff. And, and if you think it's a real problem, the chances are that lots of people who look like you or feel like you think it's a great problem too. And I can hook you up with a couple of them if you've, if you've got great ideas. And, and I, I suppose I come from a culture where, or a context where my mother was the 13th female architect in South Africa. She had to study in a second language applied mathematics. When she went to Pretoria University, she was the first person who was a woman who was English and Jewish to get a degree from the engineering faculty. Um, so I, I, I suppose I, I, I've seen it firsthand with my mother who's been able to fight away. She was born in 1928. She turns 90 in, in a week's time. So I've, I've seen her be able to fight that. And she, she um, it, th there are really good people who will support you to do the same thing. It's, it's, it's really great. So if you want to chat about VCs and people with money, they're always looking for great ideas. Well, I think, um, you know, uh, national and, and regional policies, I think we just need to organize. We are not organized nationally, not as organized nationally, uh, uh, and, uh, and this is the first step. We need to also be aware. We need to be aware of what is happening around us. And I'm not too convinced that we are aware, you know. I'm not too convinced that uh, uh, the culture of of reading, you know, uh, the culture of just reading to know what is happening around us is not really embedded uh, 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 and it's our responsibility to, to make sure that it is embedded uh, to the general population and if you can be able to succeed there, then you're going to have uh, policy makers and politicians who are going to be able to understand uh, these issues with, with all their uh, complexity. Musa, did you want to weigh in? I'll be really brief. I'm, I think uh, as a resource that you mentioned that perhaps could could really help people in the audience to think about certain things in terms of, of race and, and biology, I, I, there's, a, there's a really interesting, I think, and, and provocative in a good way, a uh, book that's just been published by a geneticist at Harvard called David Reich. It's uh, who we are and how we got here. It's about the, the history of humanity from a genome point of view and it espouses this idea that, um, that we really, all of us are just completely mixed and we shouldn't be talking about race, we should be talking about populations and we should be talking about shared ancestry and as we learn much more about each other, um, we'll start to understand this variation that exists in all our populations that skin color is highly superficial to the way that we're dividing ourselves right now. And I think this is this is this idea and, and the information that we will all learn about ourselves. Most of us will in this room over our lifetime. Our ideas around race will be radically changed, I think, by um, by these ideas, by this new knowledge that we have of, of genomics. And I think it'll really show how close we are to each other and to people who look very different from us, and also how far we are from people who look very similar to us. And, and that's gonna be a very interesting change, I think, societally. And it's important that um, we start to have the tools to be able to talk about that. Um, one book I want to point out along those lines that, that 
might be really good for people to check out is a book called Fatal Invention by Dorothy Roberts, um, which kind of traces that idea around race as technology and, and sort of the biological unreality of race, but the social construct that has destroyed black bodies throughout time. Um, so I'll read a kind of like Wikipedia definition of Afrofuturism, and then I'll talk about my, how I interpret and enter Afrofuturism. So Afrofuturism is a cultural aesthetic, philosophy of science, philosophy of history that explores the developing intersection of African, Afro-diasporan culture with technology. It combines elements of science fiction, historical fiction, fantasy, Afrocentrism, and magical realism with non-Western cosmologies in order to critique the present day dilemmas of black people and to interrogate and re-examine historical events. So in a nutshell, that's what Afrofuturism is. Um, I take some issue with that definition. Um, I think um, for me, the way I, in which I think about Afrofuturism is through the domain of time and really thinking about how the Afro modifies the future, how the Afro modifies the futurism term. Um, and I've done a lot of work around tracing this history of the word future um, and what it has meant and what it has mean um, in, in colonization and, and in colonial societies and in white supremacy, what, what that domain of the future has meant in those spaces and then therefore what it has meant for us. Um, and so in my work, I think a lot about, and, and this is speaking to the kind of practical nature of what Afrofuturism can be, um, because I think a lot of it, you know, at least the history of Afrofuturism lives a lot in academia and is very inaccessible to people on the ground, to communities, to especially the kind of communities that I serve. Um, and so for me, when I entered Afrofuturism, I was always very concerned with how is this accessible to folks who need it, who need this visionary language, um, who need this visionary thought to actually practically build alternative futures than the ones that have already been laid out or decided for them. So that's the way in which I enter Afrofuturism. Um, and again, I think about um, the domain of the future, who gets access to it. Um, and I think when we use the word future, we often take for granted that we're talking about the same future or that we make it into the future with the same at the same rate of acceleration as everybody, and we don't. Um, and so for me, the most powerful thing about Afrofuturism is the ability to think outside of a linear, oppressive future, fatalistic future that, again, has already been decided for us. And, and me working in, in, a, in a realm of housing and and um, community planning and things like that, I see every day how our government and how forces, other forces beyond our control are planning for our future. So Philadelphia, for example, literally has like five of these little Philly 2045 plans, Philly, this particular neighborhood, 2016, 2019 or whatever. And who gets, who, who makes those plans? Who's deciding what the future of this particular community or this, this city is going to be? And it's not us, it's not the people. Um, and so that's, that's how I use Afrofuturism in my work. Um, so a lot of what I do is, again, thinking about this, this idea of time, um, how time is modified by and how time and literal time like clocks and, and objects, calendars are used to oppress black bodies and have been since the time of slavery. Um, you know, and so I trace that, that line of, of, of inquiry um, using the language of speculation and, and futurism and things like that. Um, and then kind of combine that with like quantum physics and what quantum physics says about time, which is that time is reversible. Time is not just linear. Time, you know, it, it has all of these possibilities within it that um, normal, linear, Western, traditional science tells us is not possible. Um, so I use that language to think about that and to, to um, bring, bring those lines of thought to my work as a housing attorney. And so like one of the things that I've done, I have a number of different projects as both a socially engaged artist and a housing attorney, but like this is one thing like a book I've produced called Housing Futures Workbook. And I really emphasize the S on the word future because we don't all make it into the same future. We don't all have this, you know, the, it's, it can be subjective and, you know, there's, there's levels. There's your individual future, your personal future, and then there's a communal future. So that S is, is really important. The, the, the plurality of the future is really important. The quantum nature of the future is really important to me. And so I, I create um, stuff like this and I do workshops around this, this notion of 
housing futures um, to help communities envision what they want to see for the future of the community. And it's, and it's contentious. It's not always communities are not monoliths. We don't all think the same way, all want the same things. Um, sometimes we do. Um, so finding where those common threads are, um, finding where those points of contention are, um, is, is, has been really useful in my work um, to not just have my work be reactionary, um, where I'm just you know, helping people in a crisis um, or be this top-down thing where, you know, m me as an attorney working with these bodies to set policy for people, really getting the input of the people affected by these things and also infusing joy and visionary, um, you know, tactics and things into these conversations so we're not just talking about stuff that, that pains us and hurts us and that we can't see beyond because we're using the same language and tools that we've always used that actually hasn't moved the problem anywhere. Um, one of the things that I, I reflect on often is that we're in our 50, we're celebrating the 50 year anniversary of the Fair Housing Act that was put into place um, when Martin Luther King um, was murdered um, a couple days after that, which, which was meant to, um, you know, in policy and on, on letter and by letter um, eliminate discrimination from housing and 50 years later we have more discrimination in housing than we ever had and this is also like reinforced by technology or helped by technology you know um, so so yeah Afrofuturism gives gives me and, and many others Afrofuturists and people who, who practice within this this visionary creative way to deal with the old problems and and to really build and create and have input on future worlds um, for ourselves so. thank you for that So we are very much out of time, but it, just to make a couple of points coming out of this conversation, if I were to listen to all of you, I think what comes out most strongly is that we need to recognize that a particular future is not inevitable. That there are options, there are opportunities, so long as we educate ourselves about the issue, so long as we work together where there are commonalities, recognizing that there are diverging points of view, points of opinion, we, thoughts about how we should do things, but as so long as we, we work together, and so long as we begin to think outside of existing frameworks, really towards the possibilities of what might be. And I think the sentiment that's been articulated here is probably best said by Thomas Sankara, the assassinated president of Burkina Faso, when he said, we must dare to invent the future. So we thank you very much for being with us this evening, for being with us as we've thought a little bit more about how to dare to invent that future and what that future might look like. As we said in the beginning, this is by no means the totality or the end of a conversation, but really a starting point. And so we thank our colleagues at the Heinz Idol Foundation for making this evening possible. We thank um, the colleagues here at the Nelson Mandela Foundation for hosting us and for helping us all to get here. And my colleague, Lerato Motaung from the Harvard University Center for African studies. We especially thank our panel for coming and sharing so much of their expertise, so much of their personal experiences with us, and of course, we thank you. We hope that you get home safely and that we will see you again next time.